Uh, let's begin. I'm Ashutosh Varshne, uh, uh, Director of the Center for Contemporary South Asia, and welcome to the fifth meeting in this series, the fifth seminar in this series, COVID in South Asia. And our, uh, our guest speakers today are from uh, are uh, from India, as has been a pattern now for most of our meetings. Um, Shamika Ravi will speak, uh, is speaking from Delhi. I think that's where she is. Um, uh, she is a senior fellow at the Governance Studies Program of uh, Brookings in Washington, but she's based in Delhi right now and is a visiting professor of economics um, at the Indian School of Business, um, ISB. Our second speaker is Ruben Abraham, who is CEO uh, of IDFC Foundation and IDFC Institute, a think tank in Mumbai. And uh, uh, for a larger introduction, uh, you can go to our events page where uh, their um, various accomplishments have been summarized. But in the interest of time, let's move ahead uh, Shamika will give us a nationwide trends, um, however she wants to break them up uh, uh, over time, over states, uh, over urban rural. I'm not sure she will, she's uh, the master of that universe. Every single day, every morning she sends us all uh, um, uh, a notification on Twitter uh, or, or a, a broadcast on Twitter actually, summarizing um, what happened in the last 24 hours and keeping us very well informed about the trends. And, uh, and then um, in the last half hour, um, no, not, not in the last half hour, in the second uh, half hour, we'll have uh, Ruben uh, summarizing Mumbai, uh, trends in Mumbai, which has become a hotspot and I think is the biggest hotspot in, in India right now. Um, and the plan is as follows. We, they'll, they'll present uh, and speak and or speak for about 15 minutes or so. And then we'll open up for a, a Q&A uh, with respect to their presentation, move to the second presentation. And the last half hour will be, um, will be for a general discussion uh, that uh, for, uh, and in that slot, in that half hour slot, we'll cover both um, presentations and maybe both speakers can also speak um, to each other uh, in that slot. So that's the plan. Let's start with, uh, um, I know that uh, some of you are joining in from India as well, uh, from uh, some students in my class and, and some of course from Providence and some from the East Coast. So let's start with Shamika and she has slides for us and she'll share them. Thank you, Ashu. Happy to be here virtually with all of you. Um, I've put together a series of pictures, really, um, and I'll voice over, I'll talk about each of them. Um, let's start off by first getting a sense of the magnitude of the problem itself. Uh, and of course, everything is conditional on the strategy that is being followed, uh, different countries uh, have had very different policy interventions at different points in time. Uh, but it's good to look at everything in an aggregation to get a relative sense of uh, the disease burden or the infection burden or the case burden itself. Uh, and here, if you notice, uh, India is the, the green line at the bottom. Uh, obviously, this is only comparing India uh, to the hotspot nations which have more than 50,000 cases each. So th these are mostly the OECD countries from uh, Europe um, and, and it's the US. As you see, India has just crossed, it's, it's a little under 35,000 uh, as of this morning. Uh, there have been a series of policy interventions at different point in time, but you see that 35,000 uh, is, is uh, very low compared to if you see the US, which has crossed a million, if you look at Italy, Spain, UK. Uh, so. It's, it's the case load seems relatively small. If you look at the total number of COVID deaths, uh, and again, compare them with hotspot countries, and here hotspots are really countries which have had more than 3,000 deaths. So Belgium, for instance, uh, falls in this category, while it's not in the first one, because it doesn't have more than 50,000 cases, uh, but it has had uh, 
more than 7,000 uh, deaths. Uh, and the number of deaths in India related to COVID have been uh, a little over 1,100. So again, the death numbers also show uh, that the re relative severity uh, along with the case burden is, is quite muted compared to the other hotspot countries. This is to give you a sense of the timeline of how things have evolved. Uh, and at an early stage, just like uh, you know, in the US case or the European uh, uh, countries, this truly is an imported uh, infection. So what happened is very early on, and hindsight perhaps very smartly, uh, while the first case of COVID was um, announced or reported in the last week of January across most of these countries. Uh, but India was extremely proactive and I suppose it is because, you know, it's a resource poor country. Uh, prevention goes a long way for, for an economy which really has health infrastructure which is uh, limited. So very early on, uh, the Indian government started to airlift people from Wuhan, other parts of China, uh, from Italy, uh, subsequently, and also from Iran, and kept them in camps, kept them separate from the rest of the population. So people weren't allowed to mingle when they returned from these places. So quarantines, quarantine facilities were set up uh, very early on. Uh, thermal screening started at the uh, airports quite early. Now, of course, we in the news, we heard about several high profile cases where people jumped these screenings or, or blatantly lied. Uh, uh, and of course, I mean, just thermal screening is also a very uh, uh, basic rudimentary way of screening for symptoms. Uh, but nonetheless, several steps were taken uh, even before the case count really went into uh, triple digits. Uh, then what we noticed is uh, around uh, uh, you know, the 12th of March, again, very early on, uh, schools and colleges were shut down. Uh, the Epidemic and Disease Act, which is quite a restrictive, it's a very old act, more than 100 years old. But what it does do is it gives state special powers to detain or separate, uh, really, uh, people. Uh, because the nature of infectious diseases is such that it's not just an externality, you, you know, you're to the person who's infected, but increasingly uh, you become a threat to others around, the infection is likely to increase. And so this disease act, Epidemic and Disease Act, became a sort of a, a necessity. And most states of the union uh, did enact it very early on. Um, now, you begin to see the early stage, the growth was uh, rapid. Uh, we were doubling every three days, that's the rate at which uh, the growth was happening. Then, of course, a very large congregation was discovered uh, around the 29th of March, and uh, which really uh, affected more than 16 states uh, of the Union. What you do notice, though, is that the nature of the national lockdown in India is quite stringent. But the impact of this uh, massive, strict uh, lockdown, you begin to see in about 12 to 13 days after uh, this was enacted. Uh, and that is the nature of the virus. The incubation period is really about you know, 10 to 14 days. So you begin to see impacts of policies uh, after uh, you know, about 10 to 12 days. And you do see that from April 6th onwards, uh, until uh, which we were doubling cases every four days, so it was still a very rapid increase we were facing. From April 6th onwards, continuously, uh, the growth rate has declined. Uh, and as of this morning, the active cases are doubling every 15 days. So there has been a considerable decline. Uh, the total number of cases, uh, which includes recoveries and deaths, uh, those are doubling every 12 days. Now, there are data sets and data sets. There are lots of different sources. Uh, but it truly is a miracle in some ways because I've been looking at this data, all these different uh, sources of data for quite almost six weeks now. And today is the first day when the ECDC data, the Johns Hopkins data, the WHO data all uh, give you the same growth rate. So in, in that sense, it's uh, quite an anomaly, but it's, it's convincing. This gives you a counterfactual. And this is truly for, uh, you know, just to understand what decline in growth rate means for an infectious disease of this nature. Uh, and you're seeing that when you double at three days, what would the counterfactual have been? How many cases would India have really uh, had to handle? And that's over uh, 12 lakhs. Um, 
At about five days, we would have had, uh, you know, more than uh, one lakh. At seven days, we would have had about 51,000. Today, of course, we have under 35,000. Uh, this is, of course, if you keep the base as April 6th from when uh, the decline did start to uh, happen quite consistently. This is showing the seven-day um, moving average. Now, beyond the day-to-day -day fluctuations, that's what, you know, in fact, both these graphs show. Uh, on the left side panel, it's the caseloads, the daily confirmed cases. And on the right side, you have the, uh, the daily deaths. Now, both of these, the long term, we call the seven day moving average a longer term trend because you want to really smooth the noise of the day to day data. And you do see the trends are both, of course, uh, showing positive, uh, which means we are still at the growth phase of uh, this epidemic, this, this pandemic. Uh, but the growth rate has been declining. And if you see the numbers in terms of uh, the total, the average uh, daily deaths, it's, it's under 50. But this gives you a sense of the mortality rate itself uh, relative to the, uh, the population. So per million, what is the number of COVID deaths that India is facing? And you see that India is really reporting 0.85 deaths per million uh, people. Now compare that with um, uh, you know, the US, for instance, where it's a little under 200 uh, deaths per million people, or the UK, which is a little over 400. Belgium, of course, is extremely high and, and, and still increasing. Many countries in, in Europe, however, have begun to show a stabilization. So the, it, it's looking like the death rates are stabilizing, uh, except perhaps Sweden uh, and UK. And Sweden, because it has the policy that it has. And UK, because the way they are reporting death, uh, they had a massive jump yesterday when they reported 4,000 deaths, additional deaths, just yesterday. And that's because now they've started to count death in, uh, uh, you know, away from the hospital. So a lot of this, I mean, the nature of this data is such that different countries are counting things differently. Uh, and But again, the idea of looking at these cumulative cross-country numbers is to get some sense of which way we are headed. One thing I'd like to point out here is that uh, China has fixed its mortality rate at 3.34. Uh, this has not undergone any change uh, in the last one week. Uh, so there has been a revision there. Uh, but we're also not seeing um, um, uh, too many you know, differences in terms of the case count itself there. Japan, today is the first day when Japan has really uh, overtaken China's uh, mortality number. So that's the reason why you also see that in Japan, while the new cases might not be very high, the mortality numbers are shooting up. And that is the reason why they've gone back uh, to a national emergency after weeks of uh, uh, seeming success. But India is a very large country. <clears throat> and you're all uh, familiar that 1.38 billion is a very large population to study in terms of national trends. So the action truly lies at the state level. This is showing uh, what the total case count looks like and broken across recovered deaths and active cases uh, across uh, the states of the country which have more than 150 cases. And here, if you notice, I mean, uh, increasing band of uh, blue is actually a sign of uh, flattening of the curve. The gray bars are showing active, that is the current case load in terms of uh, the infection, uh, the way it is spreading. While all of India, which is the left-hand uh, panel on, on, on top, is showing that there is an increase and it's pretty smooth because it's for a very large population. You do see that Maharashtra on top in Gujarat truly are still witnessing exponential growth, uh, where the recovery, while it is increasing, but the case in terms of active cases itself is also rising exponentially. Those are states of great concern right now. If you look at Delhi, uh, Delhi had some success, uh, I'd say in the first, uh, you know, let's say two, three weeks back, we had active cases actually decline because recovery rates began to increase. But what you're seeing now in the last one week in Delhi, we are really having a second wave, which is a much bigger wave, because the active numbers have now uh, gone up uh, significantly. M M Madhya Pradesh is again adding a, a very large number. Uh, it's not exponential, but it is a, a cause of concern. It's a large state. Um, Rajasthan, after initial uh, uh, big increase, you are seeing that the blue band is increasing, which means the recovery rate is uh, improving in Rajasthan. Uh, Tamil Nadu is one of the states um, 
which has actually seen tremendous recovery, though the caseload on a daily basis is continuing to increase, but uh, recovery in Tamil Nadu is quite strong. UP, as you can see, again, increasing very uh, fast, but the blue band is also expanding. Andhra Pradesh, similarly. Telangana has started to flatten the curve, where you see recovery numbers are increasing at a, a fast rate, and active cases are, in fact, declining. West Bengal, again, still rising, cause of concern. Jammu Kashmir recovery seems good. Uh, Karnataka, things are looking good. It, it, it seems that the recovery rate is expanding. Kerala uh, has truly flattened uh, the curve. If you see that the overall recovery is much higher than the active cases. Now, Kerala is still, we still have cases there. We are still discovering new cases there as well, just as in every other state of the country. But these are relative uh, uh, terms. In, in terms of how, how much control uh, do we have over the infection uh, uh, currently? Punjab, in fact, looked pretty good for about a month. And then um, uh, you can see they have had a massive jump uh, in the last couple of days. What you will also see, and as we noticed uh, today morning, when uh, one of the cabinet ministers from uh, the Punjab uh, government, uh, he's basically blaming uh, the lack of contact tracing and screening uh, in Maharashtra. So he's saying it, people basically uh, fled uh, and jumped uh, quarantine and then landed up in Punjab. Well, this is going to happen. I mean, there is, it's not like, you know, these are completely sealed borders. And uh, we are likely to see these kind of cases uh, happen across states of the country. Bihar still has a low case count, but you can see it's still exponential growth. Haryana, pretty much like Kerala, has again flattened the curve in terms of uh, having very large recoveries. Uh, their active case count has uh, fallen dramatically over the last three weeks. So that's giving you a general sense of what the country looks like. This is the five-day moving average of new confirmed cases. And frankly, this is what we have to bring under control because this tells us um, that it's a combination. It's not, not just testing. I think in the common sort of a simplistic understanding of the infection, we think it's just testing, which is the, which is the constraint. But it truly is, is a combination of three factors. It's the containment strategy itself, uh, which is obviously a district or even a block level. It's local administration. Then the contact tracing, which is a highly scientific, it has to be done very rigorously, uh, where you go and trace uh, people who have come in contact, the primary contact, the secondary contact. So there is a lot of debriefing that is required. You need to track people's uh, call records to verify where they have been. Now you can imagine that most of these states uh, or across the country, I would say the public health uh, HR, just the capacity in terms of having enough people to do that kind of exercise is very limited. And that is why we have been appealing uh, to local governments across the country to really involve the police there. And I think that's one of the reasons why Haryana and Kerala, uh, we've just put together a case study for Kasargod, which is the northernmost district of uh, Kerala. The police was instrumental in this because first of all, they have the manpower. And secondly, they are naturally, they are trained in debriefing and, and verifying and you know, the call records, uh, verification, uh, containment itself. So truly at the local level, you need the public health, the civil administration and the police to truly coordinate this containment strategy for it to be successful. Uh, but this is what it looks like uh, in terms of new cases coming up. Look at Punjab, the bottom right-hand side corner. They've had a massive uh, increase in terms of new cases uh, yesterday. Uh, Karnataka just had a big spike. Uh, so yeah, this is still very much a dynamic problem. It's still unfolding. Uh, too early to uh, uh, say anything beyond, let's say, overall national numbers. These are giving you the COVID death rates per million again across states of the country, which have more than 150 cases. Um, relatively low mortality in Kerala, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, et cetera, et cetera. What you see is the all India average is about 0.89. Now, the reason you have 0.89 here and you had a little lower in the other, uh, you know, the international comparison is because that data set was the Johns Hopkins, which is what we used to do uh, uh, national level uh, analysis. State level analysis, Johns Hopkins does not put out state level details for India. So this is from a crowdsourced, uh, uh, this is the tracker, the COVID-19 tracker, which is really an effort of a handful of very young, bright, uh, uh, entrepreneurial, high energy uh, youngsters who really put this thing together. Uh, ideally, it should have been coming from the government, uh, but that is the state of uh, data. It's 
Maharashtra, Gujarat, Delhi, and MP, which four states which are truly pulling up the national average because the death rates in these four places uh, are much, much higher than the ordinary average. So uh, I'll end with that. That's to give you a, a sense of you know, how, how things, oh, I have a little bit on uh, testing. Now this is the confirmed cases per 100 tests. Overall testing in India has been expanding. Um, some say not enough, but you know, uh, given state capacity and uh, it has been uh, uh, rapidly increasing since the 27th of March and it has only grown exponentially since. But in terms of positive cases per 100 tests, we have flattened around four and a half percent, which means the infection rate within the population. Now, India has a very narrow protocol uh, for testing. We are still only testing people with symptoms, people who have come in contact with people or with travel history. So this is not random testing. Uh, in that sense, this should have ideally been much higher. The probability of actually striking someone positive when you, when you conduct, let's say, 100 tests should have been much higher. In the US, for instance, this was about 15, 16%. Italy uh, was about 22%. So in India, four and a half seems to suggest that the infection rate uh, uh, is quite contained. This is just telling you that same story over time across different states of the country. Uh, different states are testing uh, uh, very different uh, number of uh, samples and people. Uh, but again, this repeats the same story that it's Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, where the, the infection rate is high and it's still increasing. And that's the problem. But there are many parts of the country where it's quite low. Chhattisgarh, uh, Jharkhand, if you look at Kerala, Haryana, Odisha, um, Karnataka, you know, these are all very low infection rates, which are under 2% AP. Uh, under 2% and it's falling. Uh, so those are good signs uh, that the problem is truly not uniformly distributed everywhere. So the focus really needs to be on certain hotspots, not everywhere. This is the broader economic scenario. Uh, uh, IMF has projected 1.9 as the growth rate of the fiscal year, uh, which is a bit puzzling. Uh, they probably assumed a very large uh, government spend. Uh, but the way things are moving, I would the growth rate to be anywhere between minus two to minus three percent. Uh, very large number of uh, people uh, run the risk of uh, unemployment. Uh, we have a number of about 40 million people, mostly in the informal sector. By the way, we might have a structural break in the way labor force participation itself is going to happen. India already has a very low labor force participation. Barely 50 percent of the working age population is either working or looking for work which is very low compared to most emerging markets, including Bangladesh, Thailand, etc. Now with the fear of the disease or this infection, people who are going back to, let's say, UP Bihar, are unlikely to want to come back to the big cities uh, immediately. So I think we're looking at a structural change over the next several quarters. Uh, this is telling you that, you know, it's not an all India problem. 30 districts have very large number. So those are truly the hotspots. We have more than 315, 14 districts where, which have reported zero cases. So very quickly, we can confirm for community spread there. And, and ideally, they should all be open. Life should go back to normal there. But normalcy, well, it is a new normal. We keep talking about that, which means uh, self-protection, uh, expecting, you know, mandating masks, uh, mandating, you know, sanitizing hands, uh, social distancing, physical distancing, all of those are the new reality. So I think uh, with all possible uh, precautions, uh, we should definitely open up the economy in those parts where we don't have the cases. And elsewhere too, I would say even the red districts, uh, it's not like all of Delhi is, has very high infection rate. Those are really blocks. And the reason I say this is because, you know, for an economy of under $2,100 per capita per annum uh, GDP, we truly are a resource poor. We are a low middle income country. For us to be thinking like an OECD country, uh, uh, is, is a bit problematic because the opportunity cost of a lockdown uh, in terms of the economy and livelihood is very high and, and, and is likely to uh, push millions of people who have uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, come out of poverty in the last 15, 20 years. Uh, there, there is great vulnerability at that point. So lifting of the lockdown becomes an imminent uh, policy recommendation. Thank you. I'll end with that. Thank you, Shamika. Remarkable overview. This is what we needed. Um, now, uh, let me, um, let, let's say 10 minutes now for uh, a discussion on this presentation and we'll return to it after Ruben's presentation as well as the plan was. So let me start, uh, start you up, uh, start us up by asking um, 
uh, two questions. Um, one is that all over the world we think that um, um, COVID-19 has quite clearly uh, tracked globalization. The more globalized a place, and therefore OECD countries, et cetera, and China, the more globalized a place, the greater the incidence of uh, infection. And uh, from that it follows, the second question is simply a follow-up of the first. Uh, it's also generally believed the more rural the place, the lower the incidence of, um, of um, infection and the more urban the place, the greater the incidence. So can you comment very briefly on this as it applies to India? Bangalore seems to be, Bangalore among the most globalized cities, Bombay, we'll hear on uh, uh, an, a presentation, Bombay, Bombay among the most globalized doing badly, Delhi among the most globalized doing badly, Bangalore among the most globalized not doing ba badly it seems, and Kerala among the most globalized states of India because of migration, uh, not doing badly earlier, but not now. But let's put Kerala aside for a moment. Um, how do you respond to these, uh, to this, uh, to this, uh, to, to, to these set of concerns? So I agree with all your observations, Ashu. I think it's absolutely correct. Uh, and, but that's the, that's the nature of a, a highly interconnected global economy. I mean, you've had all the benefits of globalization and I'd say, uh, India has been one of the, uh, the beneficiaries of, of rapid globalization over the last 30 years. Uh, and we have not seen the kind of pushback to it, uh, at least from the, you know, the political economy side of it, as you have seen in the OECD countries, Europe and uh, particularly the democracies, Europe and the US. Uh, but, you know, given the dependence, uh, it's not just globalization, uh, theoretically, it's also the interdependence um, on China. And I think that poses a greater uh, uh, strategic concern for a country like India, because let's say pharmaceuticals, pharma, I mean, India uh, has been called the pharmacy uh, to the world because we do supply uh, about uh, one fifth of all generic drugs uh, globally. And yet we are dependent on uh, China for a lot of the chemicals, a lot of the inputs. So you can imagine that, and this is just pharma I'm talking about, there are many other sectors where we you know, depend on China for the inputs. And I think moving forward, uh, while we, have, we will gain from globalization, strategic interest of countries will demand, at least in the democracies, that there is a certain um, uh, push towards self-sufficiency or looking at other markets uh, outside of China uh, to really uh, lower the dependence uh, uh, and we're seeing this, by the way, in Australia, we're seeing this in uh, many other Asian countries as well. But in India, I think it's likely to be pretty strong. On the rural-urban uh, difference, again, it's an extension of exactly this. Uh, right now, it's an empirical question whether has the infection spread to rural India. If you notice, most of the green zones are in rural uh, districts of the country. Because again, you know, this is an imported infection. Uh, it remains in places, it's likely to be where uh, the flow of travelers uh, labor was highest. Uh, and that's why you have Delhi, Bombay come up. And, uh, but the spread is really not just a globalization issue. The spread issue has to do with the containment strategy, the contact tracing and the subsequent testing that comes with it. And I think the variations that we are seeing in India today, the states that have truly controlled the situation uh, have had caseloads. Haryana, I mean, Gurgaon is right here. They've had a lot of people uh, fly in. But I think Kerala, Haryana have succeeded because the local administration, uh, the kind of containment strategy that they put in place was very good. And we have to give credit where it's due. Uh, local administrations in these places have put the contact uh, uh, con containment strategy, the contact tracing, and the testing. So that goes beyond globalization. That just tells you the problem is here. How well do you manage it? Other questions? Uh, I can see Patrick's hand up. Yeah, Patrick. Thank you, Shamika. That was an amazing presentation. And thank you for uh, all, all the graphs and data that you've been putting together and sharing on Twitter. It's, I, 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 I think I speak for everyone when, when I say uh, it's been an incredible service uh, to have the data. So cogently and brilliantly presented and shared with us. So thank you for that. And I, you know, all the trends you're looking at, uh, you know, do suggest that uh, deacceleration and, and we're all breathing a sigh of relief. Um, 
But I, I ask about the underlying data. I mean, testing in India is still abysmally low, 650 per million, even in the US, you know, which has had one of the worst responses in the world, we're at 20,000 um, per million. And um, death rates, yeah, I, you'd think that would be a more robust measure. There, there isn't as much selection bias. I mean, with, with testing, there's bound to be massive selection bias, right? It's elites, it's people who have access, people who have knowledge, and, and you worry about the slums, right? Are, are folks in the slums getting tested? Um, so then you turn to death rates, and that's probably a better measure by and large, except that, you know, we know e even now we're discovering in New York City you know, bodies in, in trucks that have been unaccounted for. And as you just mentioned, in England, they're now reporting deaths at home. And one really worries if there aren't, you know, a far larger number of deaths uh, be, simply being unreported, deaths at home or deaths that have, haven't been diagnosed, et cetera. So um, I know you've thought about all this, but I'd, I'd, I'd just love to get your reactions to how good you think the underlying data is. I would point out that having followed the Kerala story carefully, um, there I don't doubt that the data is pretty good, right? Because there's there's such an intense presence of the state, the local state, the public health care system, the ability of the police and civil society to report that the data probably is pretty good, and so that that would suggest that maybe the you know the virus overall is not as as bad uh, in India as elsewhere. And then the final question is, you know, if it is. Um, not as virulent as it's been everywhere else. Why? I, I, if anything, given densities, given the public health care system, uh, one would have expected a Belgium-like situation, and yet we're getting, you know, something that's really off the charts and almost an outlier. Yeah, and on the density question, I think we should return uh, to the, we should, we should hear what Shamika has to say, but on density, we should, uh, uh, we should um, have a discussion uh, with specific reference to Bombay as well, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so let's let's hear Shamika, and I'll I'll open up one more question, then we go to Ruben. I think William had his hand up, so Shamika, yeah. Yeah. Also, okay. Thank you, thank you, Patrick. Um, uh, all absolutely uh, valid concerns. I think in every country, including Germany, we have a paper coming out tomorrow on uh, trends in Germany. Uh, Data remains a concern, Patrick. Data remains a concern everywhere because state capacity right now, I think there are very few countries which have the state capacity to even forget about testing capacity and the political economy around that. Uh, but just putting data together in a way that researchers like us can take a look at it, which is more public interest in nature. Uh, most countries, I, I think, uh, are, are you know, falling short of uh, what ought to be the standard. Um, but I think that is where I think we are putting too much focus on testing itself. And that's because, and that's why I think it's important to realize that, you know, uh, containment strategy right now becomes containment along with the contact tracing becomes as important as testing. Because imagine uh, Kerala, when they had a case count of about 100, had done, this is in Kasargod, well, all of Kerala, but in the beginning, I'm, I'm just gonna talk about Kasargod because we've written the case study on it. You know, they had done contact tracing of over 20,000 people within Kerala when they had a case count of 100, under 100. Compare that with Bombay, when they had a case count of uh, uh, under 100, just under 100, the contact tracing done there was under, you know, it was about 6,500. Now that just tells you that contact tracing is, you, it's impossible to do random testing for 1.38 billion people. I think those are the natural constraints uh, for a resource poor country uh, that we have to begin to uh, uh, ac accept and appreciate. Uh, and that's why the national lockdown becomes such an important strategy despite the huge economic cost. Uh, the, so there is testing part of it, but I, I want to uh, emphasize the contact tracing, uh, why it's, it's, it's as critical. But then, you know, on the mortality, we have also been looking at hospital level data, Patrick. And if you look at, uh, we have data for about 100 hospitals across the country, which are more than 100 bedded uh, hospitals. And we are seeing that the number of patients coming in with acute respiratory uh, uh, syndrome, you know, ailments, are looking very similar this year in the months of February, March, and April, as they did last year and the year before that. So there is reason to believe that what 
is being reported from across the states might actually be true in the sense there is no great hospital rush happening anywhere. There might be isolated cases. It's a very large country. But on the whole, the trends seem to suggest that things indeed are. It's not just the caseload, but also the virulence does seem to be uh, 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 under control, relatively. Um, uh, I think I had Will William and Arushi. Can we have both of you um, successively in the interest of time? And then we have, have Shamika respond to you. So William, will you go first? Yes. Uh, so thank you so much for your presentation. William is a public health uh, uh, student, graduate student. Yeah. Um, and I do behavioral social science with Epi as well. But so I thought, so I'm, I know you talked a lot about containment, but what I'm kind of interested in is kind of the lift of the lockdown, right? So if the strategy is kind of, if, if you, your suggestion for the strategy is more looking at hotspots in districts, how would you control for just behavior, right? Like, people are not going to kind of stay in containment such as like there's going to be movement, you know? And so if the strategy is more of at a district level and at a hotspot level, how do we uh, think about people's attitudes and behavior or patterns um, with the lift of like a kind of a calibrated way of lifting the government? And Arushi, your question? Um, yeah, Arushi very similar actually. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm doing my PhD in economics here. Uh, very similar to William actually. Uh, my concern was about the counterfactual graphs that you showed us. I mean, I'm wondering what is pertinent maybe from a modeling perspective right now is the, as you said, the imminence of, of the lifting of the lockdown. So I'm wondering if you've been able to model just how, what those graphs would look like once the lockdown lifts, um, because this can't go on. I mean, the containment in, in this, it may not be representative of what is going to happen. Yeah, great, thanks. Excellent questions. You know, Williams first. William, there is a concept, and I, you're probably familiar with this, of elasticity of demand for self-protection. We are all going to be much more careful, uh, regardless of state policies. We are going to wear gloves and wear masks and not hug and probably do more namastes or whatever it will be. But physical distancing is the new norm for the next few years, right? There is also a great fear of the unknown. And I think the fact that there is so little information out there in the public domain, people are very, very afraid. So every time they've done a survey of what do you think should happen with the lockdown, overwhelmingly, you can, I mean, there's the business side of the story. And the economist in me worries a great deal about continuing lockdown. But people support it. And that's largely also on account of the fear of the unknown. The, the fact that we have not got detailed data for India, which says, you know, the kind of JAMA study, which came out saying 80% people will not need any intervention. Tw of the 20% that will need, only 5% will truly need hospitalization of an ICU nature or a ventilator, et cetera. Those are not based for, you know, based on Indian data, uh, William. Okay. So again, to be, and, and this is happening largely because we don't have, localized contextual Indian data to base our premise on. So we're going by what we are hearing in other countries. That's number one. On account of the uh, modeling, it's exactly a Russian extension of the same. That you know the EPI models, the reason we started doing this statistical analysis every day is because the EPI models are all assuming parameters from early stage in China or the diamond princess, or let's say early state Germany, the predictions for India were 600 million people, 500 million people are going to be infected. Those are fantastical numbers, but if you look at the parameters, they, they are not valid for India. Now, you really need to estimate, it's not about guesswork, you need to estimate what should the R not be, what is the level, what is likely to drive the infection. I would say Kerala, and Punjab are going to have very different, uh, uh, you know, the social norms are different, uh, weather is different. So you are going to, or maybe perhaps even innate immunity, who knows. But you need to estimate those parameters at a highly localized level, or at least separately for India, to then use these models. So we said, you know, let's put aside the EPI models because we don't have knowledge of parameters for Indian population. Let's look at statistical analysis of existing trends. And we have noticed that the expectation of the infection rate should be exponential. But from April 6th onwards, it is seemingly linear. 
And that's where you begin to believe that, you know, the suppression strategy of such a stringent nature becomes, you know, it's effective. Of course, it's very costly, but it is effective. Now, when it is lifted, it will be a combination of everything, William. Nobody is going back to life as it were. So I think it will depend on the exact enforcement at the local level of what, how firms are going to enact. Firms are going to expect social distancing. You're not going to have so many meetings, mostly virtual again. Uh, we will even at the factory, you know, shop floor, we will have distancing. We'll have people wearing masks and gloves, etc. So a lot of it really becomes an empirical question. You're moving forward, let's wait and see. But it's important to lift the lockdown simply because, you know, I mean, it's a virus. We don't have a vaccine. The death rate is low. The caseload is low. It's too heavy an economic price for a poor country. So let's break a few eggs to make the omelet. Let's see as, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work on it as it goes along uh, and much more localized, not national level. Thank you. Thank you, Shamika. Uh, let's move to Bombay now. Uh, and Ruben uh, has some fresh data that no one has seen before. So Ruben, uh, you, you put together your slides and we, we now analyze, we, we look at the, the biggest hotspot of India. Sure. Um, so before I start, I just want to, uh, you know, caveat the fact that I'm not a healthcare person. Our focus has been state capacity. And so therefore, from a state capacity perspective, this entire thing has been really, really fascinating. And the problem that we've had in Mumbai certainly is that um, we've actually had, had no data. And the data is all contradicting each other. Uh, even the number of deaths seem to be contradicting each other. Uh, and so on. So, but I managed to convince somebody at the Bombay Municipal Corporation to uh, share some stuff with me, and that's what I'm just going to quickly show you. Um, you will share your screen with us. Yeah. There you are. Um, can you see it now? Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, before I start, um, I, I just want to just give some context in terms of, um, you know why we got involved with this to start with. So um, we were um, actually, we do a lot of state capacity related work in Kerala. So about six weeks back, uh, Kerala called us in to do some, to help them do some modeling work for them. Um, and it became very, very clear to us very quickly that, um, that Kerala was literally light years ahead of anyone else in the country in terms of the kind of protocols they'd already put in place. Now keep in mind, now this is a trend that you'll see uh, worldwide, which is that countries and regions that have had a previous experience with a pandemic-like situation respond much better. So you look at Taiwan, Taiwan basically put systems in place on December 30th. Um, Kerala, because of its experience with Nipah, had actually got a whole range of systems that were um, in place six, seven weeks ago. So what am I, so I remember five weeks ago, um, they showed me their funeral management protocols. Right? And, and it's a very detailed funeral management protocols that they put into place. So that was the level of thinking that was going on there. And also it became clear to us that the rest of India at some level had not gotten it down to that level of granularity. So one of the things that we did very early on was to actually create a process document of everything that Kerala had done. So we had basically created a 26 page version, a 15 page version and a three page version. And we offered it to states. And uh, as you can imagine, Ashu, um, of most of the states that we gave it to basically ignored it. And they ignored it basically saying, uh, Kerala has the largest number of cases, right? And they weren't actually thinking about the strategy that Kerala was employing. They were just looking at the caseload. So if you look at the strategy, the strategy was Kerala had very clear ideas in terms of they did not want people to come to hospitals. They want only critically ill people to come to hospitals. So they had basically architected a system that sort of responded to that. So, so in effect, that's where we came from. And we basically set up a sort of track to uh, effort. Uh, Shamika is part of it as well. And that track to effort has now actually grown fairly dramatically. Um, I think we've got about 140 experts backed by about 60 to 70 researchers and a modeling team at MIT and Chicago um, that are basically backing this effort. It's broken down into 20 subgroups. Uh, so subgroups ranging from um, uh, uh, supply chain management. We've got subgroups looking at law and order. We've got subgroups looking at data modeling. 
um, and so on and so forth. So, so a lot of what I will really contribute is from real world actually looking at, and, and you know, to be fair, a lot of what we've done is just firefighting, right? So uh, containers getting stuck at JNPT at the port and how do we basically get the containers out? That sort of thing. So I can, I can lend a lot of sort of practical stuff that we've seen um, as well. But let's just first look at uh, uh, Mumbai and Maharashtra. So Maharashtra obviously has uh, the largest number of cases in the country. I think the, uh, the latest number was approximately uh, 10 and a half thousand as of yesterday, uh, confirmed cases. Um, the blue is the daily deaths. Uh, Shamika has already talked about the fact that mortality in Maharashtra and in Bombay seems to be very high. Uh, we don't really know why that is uh, the case. Uh, the, the graph at the bottom is uh, the top five districts. Uh, Mumbai is the is the blue, and the yellow is Thane. So, and and there's another district there which is Palgar. So, three of those lines are Greater Mumbai. So, if you just look at Mumbai, Mumbai has more confirmed cases than the second state in India. So, Gujarat uh, is number two on the state count, but Mumbai actually has more cases than Gujarat does. Okay. Um, this is just giving you daily number of positive cases. Uh, you know, it's just basically yo-yoing at some level. Uh, yesterday, it was about 417 cases. One of the things that people in Mumbai, at, certainly in the government, believe uh, the reason for why you're seeing a lot more confirmed cases in Mumbai is because Mumbai is also doing a lot more tests. So this is basically Mumbai compared to other states. Um, so clearly, Mumbai is doing way more testing than uh, any other state, leave, leave alone any other uh, city. So that's something to sort of take into consideration. Um, these are active cases, um, um, recovered cases. So again, Shamika has, has gone into most of this. So I won't, um, uh, I'm just wondering if there's anything here to really point out. No, there isn't. This is an interesting one. Um, this is, so, you know, we've always considered COVID to be a disease that really affects the elderly. But if you look here, so yes, the deaths are still mostly happening in age groups above 50. But if you look at both the confirmed cases as well as deaths, so certainly confirmed cases, there's a lot happening under 50. And also the number of deaths, it's not as insignificant number of deaths that are happening under 50. There are quite a large number of people dying under 50. Again, why this is, nobody really knows. Now, um, one of this could just be that, you know, respiratory health in general is very, very poor in the country, even among the young. Um, so, so, I mean, we don't really know what is going on, but this was something that really sort of stood out in terms of um, something that was really unusual um, happening in Mumbai. Uh, Shamika, I don't know if, if this same, you see the same thing across the country, but um, uh, this was really fascinating that there were so many more cases uh, amongst supposedly a healthy population. <laughs> and then this, I think this is probably the most important slide to show you. Um, this is, we've just broken it down by wards. And I think this is the data that is most important. So it's, it just basically shows you, you know, the darkest wards are basically the, uh, uh, most number of cases. So if you look there, the two um, um, wards in the middle, uh, I can't really see what those are, G, S, and something else. Uh, those two are basically where all the slums are. So Dharavi, Kolivada, all of those are basically in that area. So it is becoming very clear. So for instance, I live in HW, which is not really affected. So going back to a point that Shamika made earlier, I think we need to start being a lot more nuanced about our sort of lockdown strategy, especially in these humongous cities, because to treat all of Mumbai as one, when you can see this huge differential, I don't think makes any sense. So, so in effect, it is slowly becoming clear that it is a problem that is in the slums and in the chawls. Um, now, you know, one way to think about that is, think of the Diamond Princess, and think of Dharavi, right? I mean, so it's, it's probably a good proxy to think of, except that people on the Diamond Princess had access to uh, individual toilets and probably were less dense than Dharavi. 
right? So if the if the uh, rate of inf the prevalence on the Diamond Princess was about twenty percent, I think we should probably assume that twenty to thirty percent is probably the prevalence in places like Dharavi. Now, because we aren't doing any random testing, we don't actually know uh, what's actually going on. Uh, but I think it's fair to assume that about 30% in the slums and chawls, are, there's probably that sort of prevalence, which then leads you to ask the question of what should we do? And I think in places like that, I don't think there's any point doing things like contact tracing. I think those areas are on a path to managed herd immunity. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I, don't, I, I just can't imagine what else we could do in these places because you're not going to be able to contain, ask people to maintain physical distance when they're basically living six and eight people in 200 square feet. I don't think it's possible. So what is the solution? And so given the low mortality rates, now again, this is a number that we've been trying very hard to get, which is to see if there's a way to break down mortality by wards. And that unfortunately is not available. But, um, but I, think, I think in terms of what we need to do in the slum and shawl areas is something that needs to be considered uh, very seriously. And, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Um, uh, once again, uh, sorry, uh, I, I, if I, you just want to see the, the, the contact tracing, yeah, that, those are the numbers. Okay. First of all, I've already received a lot of requests. So uh, uh, requests asking me whether uh, Shamika and Ruben can share their slides with us, sure. um, and I hope you will be able to because, because these are these are systematic. Uh, 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 this is systematic data nationwide, statewide, and then now now breaking down Mumbai into these wards and and trying to see where the the largest uh, incidence is. But one question for uh, Ruben, Ruben, you in, in on your um, uh, slide which said age um, structure of uh, those affected, those infected, you also had gender there, or did you not? Uh, hang on a second, yes, there was gender. Yes. Um, is it a, a like elsewhere, mostly male um, disease, or are you getting very substantial female um, infections as well. And uh, then I'll, I'll ask Shamika to, to comment on this. Yeah. Sure. So if you look at 21 to 30, 47% yeah. is female. That again seems an anomaly to me, but yeah. I don't know what the national data on this looks like. But that really does strike, a, a strike a, you know, sort of stick out. Is that 21 to 30, almost 50% is women. In the 21 to 30, in the healthiest... <laughs> Yes, exactly. Um, and then, and then, if you go half half of those infected are women. Yes, and then if you go to seventy one and to eighty, yeah. again forty five percent, forty one percent, forty five percent are women. I so I don't. I mean, it's certainly an anomaly compared to global numbers. Yeah. I don't know what it's like compared to other numbers in India. Shamika, any comment on that? You have you seen it yourself? I haven't looked at gender wise breakup in India. Um, uh, and uh, but I can tell you that from Germany, yeah, uh, that's the paper coming out uh, tomorrow. Uh, there is, you know, women over time have become majority of the cases. Uh, but if you look at the the mortality numbers itself, there is a large and increasing with time gap between men and women. Men are much more likely to succumb to the disease, and this is across age groups. Across age groups. So, in fact, so a very clear distinction to be drawn between infection rates and mortality rates on the gender question. Absolutely. At least from the German data, I should, you yeah. know, it go, by the way, it goes back to a lot of the uh, medical literature, uh, uh -huh. which links it to either smoking, but of course, in Germany, that difference is not very large, as in China. Uh, yeah. People have talked about uh, innate immunity. Yeah saying women have higher immunity to some of these uh, uh, viruses. So right. there are multiple reasons, nothing uh, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, convincing right now. There are many things out there. Okay. So let's open it up. Oh, who would, uh, yes, I can see Patrick's hand again. Yeah. Patrick, go ahead. Thanks, Ruben. That, that was fascinating. I, I have a, a ton of questions for you about Kerala, but maybe I'll take those offline and send you an email. I'd, I'd love to hear more about 
the work that you and Shamika and these other teams are doing. It's totally fascinating. Um, and, and before and, we went online, uh, uh, Patrick, before we went online, uh, we heard that both Ruben and Shamika are originally from Kerala. Oh, no, I know, I know, I know. And, and there's, I mean, I agree, there's a story about not only state capacity, but public action there, because it's about co-production with civil society, right? I mean, you can have a lot of police officers and you can have a lot of good bureaucrats, but if you don't have compliance from citizens and willingness to step forward, but... I'll, I'll take that conversation offline. Can I, can, I I, just, can, yeah. can I just respond to that, Patrick? I think it's a very important point that you're raising because you see in a lot of other places, this has been treated purely as a law and order problem. Right, right. right? Because the minute you treat it as purely a law, law and order problem, is it, you get an us versus them response. Absolutely. What you need is an us versus the disease response. Absolutely. And I think that's what Kerala has done brilliantly precisely because of what you just outlined. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've quoted the chief minister saying th this, this, this is not a law and order issue. This is about people's participation, you know, which is a, a 30 year old uh, call to arms in Kerala. So, um, but I want to come back to your, your point about the, the slums of, of Mumbai. And I'm, I'm not sure whether um, this is good news or bad news. So just doing some back of the envelope calculation I mean, the slum population in Mumbai is roughly 50%. You know, that, that could be six, seven million people. 20% of six, seven million people is an awful lot of people. And if the fatality rate is even on the lower end of the estimates, we could talk, we could be talking about tens of thousands of people dying, uh, given your estimate that it's 20% in the slums who might uh, have, have uh, contracted this. Apparently, so, so that's not happening. Can I just clarify, just to yeah. be sure, um, that you have to take into account asymptomatics. So yeah. a very large number of these could just be asymptomatic. So in, sure, in but Russia, again, just to give you the numbers on that. So, uh, and, and again, these numbers are flying all over the place. But generally speaking, the assumption is that about 80% of cases in Mumbai are asymptomatic. Right, right. Right, but still, those are 20% 20, 20 of the slums in a city that's 50% slums and has 20 million people is still an awful lot of people. And, and you know, whether you take a low or a high-end estimate of fatalities, um, it, it could be a lot of fatalities, but apparently it isn't, yeah. which, which comes back to something, uh, Chamika, and, and you have alluded to, but, and hasn't been discussed a lot, but you know, but maybe there is a story about immunity systems here, you know, that, that, that um, the Indian population, for whatever reasons, and I, I know there's no solid evidence of this yet, but there's just such a discrepancy between, you know, the numbers that were expected and the numbers that we're actually getting, even if there's some underlying data problems. Um, and I, because I think you're exactly right. I mean, you know, Ashu and I have been doing survey work in 15 Indian cities, and the percentage of people in the slums who don't have access to sanitation or water is actually much higher than the census data, you know, and it's crowded conditions and people have extensive social networks, et cetera. So for all the reasons you said, you would expect this explosion of the virus in slums. And yet, apparently that's not what we're seeing. So I, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a little mystified. I, I don't know if this is good news or bad news. So, I mean, look. So, uh, uh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no. So, I mean, the way I would look at it is if, if we can move to a managed herd immunity strategy in containment zones, I actually think of it as good news simply because this is how ep epidemics die out. So, so it, it's, my problem is it's not clear to me what else you are supposed to do. Yeah. Because pretty much the only thing you can do at this point of time is to make sure that the, the high prevalence remains in the containment zones and that it does not escape from there. But what do you do about what is actually happening within the containment zones? It, you know, I'm, I'm baffled. I mean, to, to, your, to your other point, I mean, you know, so you've got theories about BCG, uh, you've got theories about, uh, you know, hydroxychloroquine, you've got theories about heat and humidity, uh, <laughs> immune systems. It's just hard to tell what's going on. I, I, by the way, the, 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 there's also apparently a paper in the works that talks about viral load mm -hmm. and that this particular strain in India apparently has a lower viral load than elsewhere. Now it's, it's in the works. I don't know what, when that paper is coming out. But MIT uh, 
I, I haven't yet seen it, but it's been cited a lot. I have not been able to read it. Apparently, there's an MIT study pointing to temperature as yes. a key variable. Not an, not, it's a multivariate equation, So, but yes. a very high coefficient they would like to put on, yes. on in temperature in that, in that multivariate model. Uh, so, I, have no idea, so, I have no idea how you would like to react so to that. I, I should, I, it, so certainly, I, I do think that there is a connection to temperature. But then you have to worry about a potential second wave because remember, our flu season is the monsoon. Right. Hmm. So in the paper that uh, we are working on, this is a separate paper. Uh, this one really looks, latitude comes out as a very strong, yes. you know, uh, explanatory variable. Uh -huh. And latitude, I presume, you know, humidity, uh, temperature, many things go into that. But latitude is a very, very strong uh, you know, explanation for the caseload itself. I see. Other questions? Other people who would like to ask before I don't want to be asking, Patrick and I shouldn't be asking all the questions. All right. So let me, let me uh, proceed further. The, um, the, um, the concept of herd immunity um, can we discuss this a little bit more? Some people argue that the so-called herd immunity develops after 60% uh, in a given uh, denominator are infected. Um, and uh, some people say half, about half of them infected and then, uh, um, and that anyway, but wherever you draw a threshold, a threshold of 30%, let's say, or 20% in Dharavi is going to be quite high if um, most people are not asymptomatic and don't have low symptoms, right? It, it's a, it's so can, can you just say a bit more about how you understand the idea of herd immunity, which several people are playing with. It's not just, you know, uh, and, and the claim that in poorer societies, in low-income countries or low-middle-income countries, you would not have the OECD style of testing possible. And even here in the United States also, it's not happening that much. Um, Rhode Island, uh, where I teach, is now apparently has the highest testing rate in the country at this point, which is very interesting. Um, um, but uh, but tell, uh, give us, both of you, give us your thoughts on herd immunity and its application to India and or Bombay. So, uh, frankly, you know, I don't, I don't know what the herd immunity um, literature uh, mm. is telling us, particularly, you know, for this particular, you know, this particular virus. Mm. But um, given the number of uncertainties and the kind of uncertainty we are dealing with uh, in this infection, uh, you know, the Dharavi example becomes interesting because, you know, even in Singapore, after uh, an extremely well-managed situation for months. Exactly. Uh, they've had to go back to a national lockdown uh, because of a very large number of, uh, uh, you know, relatively poor uh, people in the hostels. These are mostly, you know, labor. Uh, so these are camps. Now, wherever you have such high density of, of, of living sort of condition, you're likely to see this. But I think the Dharavi uh, example also tells us, uh, Ruben, that you know, the state doesn't have to always, it's home quarantine is not necessarily the right way to move. I mean, Den Bombay has, does have, uh, uh, you know, lots of schools and colleges. We have a lot of facilities for public quarantines. Maybe people should be moved out. I mean, the fact that we're trying to keep all these people, and I've been told this often, that, you know, don't compare Castle Gold in Kerala with uh, Bombay because Bombay is different. Now, frankly, I don't know what is Bombay's contact tracing or containment strategy specifically. I'm not talking Maharashtra, Bombay. You see, when we wrote up the case study for Kasargod, it was very clear because we spoke to different pillars of administration and everybody knew exactly what their role was. There was no turf war in the sense everyone had very clear instructions and mandates drawn out and people knew about it. So the civil society was mobilized in, in the reference that Patrick made earlier in, in exactly the way the administration wanted it to play its role. A lot of confidence building exercise, you know, Mohanlal was brought in 
um, a superstar, a movie superstar. He went out and gave a lot of messaging. Now, I think, you know, Dharavi has to be dealt with from a similar strategy of saying, look, we have to do aggressive testing and contact tracing, but let's not think of containment as, uh, you know, being limited by this particular infrastructure of the slum. Perhaps people who who have been tested positive can be moved to a public uh, uh, facility. I don't know uh, uh, what the situation there is, but clearly the way the numbers, and it's not just uh, Bombay, right? I mean, we know that the numbers are increasing in Ahmedabad as well, right. and, and Surat, and Pune. Pune also surprisingly has very high mortality, so I don't know if it is the age factor or what is it that is playing uh, 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 that role there. But I do think that not having a clear strategy is, is uh, uh, you know, uh, affecting the way the infection is spreading in these specific cities. So I don't think we should let go of the local administration so easily. I do think there is, a, there is something amiss there. So, uh, uh, Ashu, let me, let me just quickly, uh, on, on the question of herd immunity. So, uh, for influenza A, it is typically assumed that if, if you have prevalence, if you get to about 50%, then you get you develop some sort of herd immunity. With this virus, we just don't know uh, what the right number is. So it's 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 actually very hard to tell. What's the number uh, of influenza what, again? What's the number of influenza again? Uh, about it's about fifty percent. Fifty percent. Okay. Yeah. Um, for on the question of uh, quarantine and the protocols in Bombay. So and I by the way I think this is part of the problem. So right now the way it works in Bombay is that if you are, if you basically test positive, whether you have mild symptoms, you're asymptomatic, it doesn't matter, you're transferred to a facility, right? Now, I think that just unnecessarily loads the system. Instead, you could just use some simple heuristics and you basically say, look, uh, if you have access to a room and a bathroom, right? An independent room and an independent bathroom, you can home quarantine as long as you are basically either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. Which, by the way, if you have that, you also encourage testing. You can get more people willing to test if you actually have that. Right now, everybody gets moved to a quarantine facility. Instead, what I'm saying is you can actually take off the load, the load off the system by actually sending people to quarantine facilities who are typically people who can't maintain physical distance. I think those are the people who should actually be in a quarantine facility. Now, having said all of this, the good news is that Bombay is also ramping up its surge capacity fairly dramatically. So they're expecting the, the virus to peak in the city by say mid-May and a little after, by which point of time they expect to have about 75,000 isolation beds. I see. Um, the one more hypothesis uh, and your thoughts on that, um, when we think of uh, in low, very low numbers in India, um, um, a, a hypothesis that, that people are proposing, um, at least here outside, is that India is exceptionally young as a country. And... Um, and with 70% of the population below 35, or what is it, below 30, um, and the um, the incidence, at least the international uh, data suggesting that this is um, uh, this affects this infects and affects uh, the older populations much more. Um, look at the nursing home story in in the United States. I think Patrick was giving me some data the other day. It could be something like um, one fourth of all deaths in 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 United States, or maybe in Rhode third. Island, it's two thirds. In, in Rhode Island, it's two thirds. A nursing home story. And so it's a, and I, on the BBC yesterday, I was talking about care homes, what they call care homes in Britain. There, there also the incidence is exceptionally high. Now, do you find um, how do you react to this? This idea that since, since India is exceptionally young compared to other countries. It is not even, uh, it's not going to get very high aggregate rates of infection. Yeah, so, so very quickly, um, it, it is true that we have a different demographic structure. But again, going back to what I said earlier, keep in mind the fact that even young Indians have very poor health. So, you know, you've basically doubled the rate of heart disease uh, as Italy. You've got the highest prevalence of respiratory illnesses in the world, home to one in six people with diabetes. 
Then you've got other stuff like we we basically have multi generational uh, joint families. This this all this other stuff also going on that we need to factor in. So yes, it may be true that um, our youth plays in our favor, but there's also complicating stuff out there. Shamika, any your thoughts on this? Well, you know, um, relatively yes, we are a young country, Ashu, but we have over 150 million people above the age of 60. So there is a large population, uh, but I think uh, Ruben's point of comorbidities is, I think, extremely important here. India has very high uh, uh, NCD incidence, non-communicable diseases. And, and those comorbidities, at least from the literature, uh, the medical science side tells us that people with comorbidities tend to have, you know, be much more vulnerable with these kind of infections. Uh, but again, I mean, that, is, that can only explain the caseload. I wish, you know, we had patient level data to really understand that who, who, who are the people amongst the ones infected in India who truly need this kind of intensive care. Again, that number is very low. Very few people have required ventilators and ICU support. Um, so yeah, I mean, we are like really reading tea leaves right now. I see. And there's um, um, one more, um, your, your, this, this is necessarily speculative, but still I think this speculation can be based on some prior analytic base. Um, how do we understand the question of whether there will be a second wave of infections in India? How do we understand that? Um, uh, so peaking in Mumbai mid-May, peaking, it has peaked already. Uh, Shamika, are you, aren't you suggesting that it's peaked nationwide as far as the aggregate nationwide data is concerned? A state, no, some states, yeah? We are still in the growth phase. The we are still in the growth phase. Kerala, Haryana, and Tamil Nadu. Those are the three states where we have seen a reversal. I see. Uh, now, nationally, it's so still growing, we, and I think it will grow for a, a couple of more weeks. A couple of more weeks. And then, uh, um, then you are expecting um, a plateau and then decline, um, or and then at some point, uh, what people are calling a W effect as opposed to a V effect. Um, a W effect with a plateau, uh, not a point at the top, but a plateau at the top. How do we understand something like this? Um, Singapore apparently is going through a second wave. So how do we understand uh, something like I this? I think all the diff there are so many different factors that are going to determine uh, the second wave. One is, of course, the, the flu season itself. I mean, and this is something we're hearing for most economies. I don't think India will be particularly an exception there, but Within India, we have noticed Delhi is currently going through a second wave uh, and a much bigger wave than the first one. I mean, we had relatively, I mean, despite the initial numbers that exploded here, uh, we had two weeks of relative, uh, you know, good suppression. The active cases were coming down very sharply and the recoveries were rising. And we have seen in the last five days or so, uh, the active cases have started to increase and now much more than they were in the beginning. So. Um, it is, it is going to be a combination of, uh, again, those three things, the containment, the contact tracing, and the testing. Now, if you throw in the monsoon season, once the lockdown is lifted, how are people going to respond? Are we going to go back to gatherings? And, and, and you know, so it, this is very much an empirical question. So, Ruben? Yeah. No, no, no I, that's fine. Um, I think Banu has a question. Yes. Oh. Manu, do you have a question? I can't see you. You have you have you un you are uh, okay. Now I can see you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Ashok. Thank you, Ruben, for your presentation. My question is essentially uh, on Mumbai. Uh, unfortunately, you know, experience tells us that the kind of information that you have can only come via BMC. And I wanted to know more about what Mumbai is doing in terms of. Um, the COVID related response, specifically uh, what, at least what we know of Mumbai is that the Mumbai corporation is, you know, budget wise, financially, legislatively has the sort of a big domain. And uh, my own understanding is that BMC handles health, uh, public health for the entire city. So when it comes to COVID related responses as well, is it Mumbai or is it Mumbai plus the Maharashtra government, which is doing Mumbai COVID related responses? And the second question is that 
uh, I was it wasn't very clear from your presentation. Now it seems like what newspapers have re reported the GS ward is the one which has had highest number of cases. But the fact is, you know, uh, GS ward isn't just just informal uh, housing or slums. GS ward has other sort of various kinds of um, uh, uh, housing types as well. So it, would it be right to suggest that containment zones are I, essentially, is there more granular data available to suggest what these containment zones are or uh, what kinds of housing types do they exist in? Sure. So, so very quickly, um, you know, and maybe I can tie this with what I wanted to say earlier uh, when Shanika was speaking, which is, I think, so, so uh, quickly, Banu, the quick response is it's BMC that handles most of the response within the, uh, within the realm of the Municipal Corporation of Mumbai. Now, keep in mind, there are other municipalities in the greater Mumbai region who are not sourced, you know, they don't have the resources as a Mumbai does. So, Ulaf Nagar, you know, none of them have, actually have capabilities. So, that's the caveat. But certainly, within the main part of the city, it is BMC that is driving the response. Is Thane um, under BMC? No. no. That's a separate, that's a separate municipal that's corporation. separate municipality altogether, right? Okay. Yes, yes exactly. Um, so, um, in terms of your question about, um, so, so okay, let, let me just go back a second. Yes, it is possible that we will get a second wave um, and so on, which is why I think the only thing we should be focusing on is to build the search capacity. And this is what Kerala has been focused on from day one. And by the way, even today, if you look at the excess capacity that they've built and they're doing mock drills, Right. Last, last week, I participated in three, three mock drills with huh. actors as COVID patients. Right? And they're integrating the entire IT platform. And they basically are reporting two uh, cases a day, eight cases a day, that sort of thing. But the amount of surge capability, capacity that they're building up, which is, I think, what I think most big, certainly hotspots should be doing, at least until the vaccine comes. So I think... That's is, that, is that because, uh, sorry to intervene, is that because, but I think we lose this important point, is that because a lot of Keralites from Malayalis from, from the Middle East are likely to return now? Is that that's why the search capacity has to be uh, up to the mark? Yes? That's definitely one reason why they are keeping that kind of search capacity in place. Right. But also, even for that, the kind of protocols that they've already put in place uh, on how to do with uh, the Malayali who are going to come back. Yeah, in place. So, by the way, these protocols were in place earlier. So, in terms of the, the way the database works, which is it merges immigration data, flight manifests. So, Kerala was the one state where you could actually find. So, if it was an Emirates flight coming in from Dubai to Kerala, they didn't want to know that piece of information. They actually knew where you were originating from. I see. Right. So, they had actually integrated all of that into their dashboard that they've maintained, right? So, 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 so I, think, I think surge capacity and building surge capacity is the critical piece. And so, you know, whatever, whether it's basically using real estate facilities that are completely unused today, there's, there's a whole range of things. In Bombay, the biggest piece of surge capacity is our indoor stadium, has basically been completely repurposed to be a, a, a isolation facility. So I think that's the sort of thing that we need to do. Uh, Banu, in response to your question about GS Ward, uh, yes, in the ideal world, absolutely. So, I mean, GS Ward, keep in mind that entire area is also where some of the most expensive residential real estate in the, in the world is. I mean, leave alone in India, right? But they all now fit into, uh, so Malabar Hill also falls into some of those wards, right? So the problem is, where's the granularity of the data? So if, again, if I were to think about it, I mean, this is just a thought experiment, right? If we could actually have data by zip codes, I think that's the sort of thing that we should sort of look at to basically fine tune our response. Right now, the response is Bombay is a red zone. That's just not helpful. It, it, it's just not helpful. Shamika, any comments on that? No, agree with everything that Ruben has said, as okay. always. <laughs> <laughs> Other question, I think Patrick's hand was up too. Okay, yes, sir, go ahead. Yeah, let me see who's it. Akshan, yeah, yeah, go ahead. You're sitting in Mumbai, aren't Hi. you? Yes, yeah, yeah. Zooming from Mumbai, Akshan is our undergraduate student. Go ahead, yeah. 
Great. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to bring another dimension into this discussion, if that's okay. I think it was touched upon a little before um, the opportunity cost of the lockdown, um, in particular for Mumbai, um, and how you think, uh, you know, how has the state been able to leverage their state capacity to um, protect low income and um, migrant populations, like the most vulnerable populations? And, um, you know, if there's something you think they could be doing better. Uh, I mean, look, it has, so again, th that's a relative question, right? I mean, what's your comparison? Right. So is, is Mumbai doing better than some other places in India? Yeah, for sure. But is it doing as well as Kerala? Absolutely not. So, you know, I mean, you constantly hear of stories of people not being able to access food. Um, the cops having a very sort of heavy handed response in certain cases. You know, people say vegetable vendors going out and the cops going and beating them up and things like that. Um, and, and by the way, because it's an important point, let me just, just, let me just pivot on that for a second. And I think this is something that India needs to get down, uh, which is our communication strategy is just useless. I mean, to put it mildly, right? And, 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 and so therefore, the, from whether it's from the state capitals or the national capital, all you're seeing is basically notifications and then clarifications to notifications, <laughs> right? And then clarifications to the clarifications. Right? Now the problem is, so as far as they are concerned, and, and I don't blame them, as far as they are concerned, they've done their job, right? You flag an issue to them, they have resolved it. Now the question that you have to ask is, how is this message now going to the front line? And very often you see that this message is not transmitting to the front line. So for instance, the, the directive very clearly says that food delivery is okay. But then in the early days, food delivery boys got beaten up. Right? So, so I think this communications piece, which I don't think people talk about enough, but I think whether it's ease of doing business or it's basically something like a public health crisis, we have to improve our communications architecture. So a lot of what you see in Bombay in terms of like, you know, bad experiences have actually been caused because the front, I mean, look, again, I don't blame the front line necessarily. They are taking on enormous risk to be where they are, right? right? So at that particular point of time, if there isn't a clear channel of communication, et cetera, yeah, I mean, expect some bad stuff to happen on the front line. Okay, uh, three minutes left. One, only one question perhaps now and only brief responses will be possible. Uh, the question that nobody uh, is paying a lot of attention to, some attention now in India from in the newspapers, how do we understand the more recent Gujarat spike? Why is it the second biggest, uh, second biggest uh, set of infections now after Maharashtra? Brief responses from both of you, Shamika and Ruben. Well, I think the reasons are the same as Bombay, Ashu. I see. Uh, and, and, uh, and I do think on hindsight, mm -hmm. in terms of a lot of the early policies of air travel ban, etc., mm -hmm. I think the one big miss was that India allowed travel from the Middle East until much later. And you know, the two states which are very closely connected with the Middle East are indeed Maharashtra and Gujarat. There's a lot of flow of people. And, uh, but of course, once that has happened, eventually it is the, the containment strategy, the contact tracing and the testing, this, this whole package. How well is the local administration able to implement it? Uh, then becomes very critical. But the caseload in the beginning, I think, is largely on account of travel from the Middle East. So, um, so very quickly, anecdotally, uh, I just heard today that the walled city in Ahmedabad is beginning to start looking like the GS ward in Bombay. Uh -oh. I see. Um, I, I don't have the data, but this is what I just heard today. Right. Um, I think I speak for everyone uh, when I say... This has been a truly remarkable, thought-provoking and enlightening virtual seminar. So thank you, uh, Shamika and Ruben, for, for, the, for what, you, what you gave us to think about, to, to, um, to reflect on. And uh, I hope you will uh, share your slides with us. Uh, there are three more requests that have come on the chat, uh, through the chat function. Um, I hope you'll do that. And of course, we'll cite you when, you, when we use your, your slides. But, um, uh, but thank you. 
Thank you very, very much. Thank you.